Thank you. Uh, a disclaimer. Uh, someone asked me, why don't I wear the same tie as I used to? Uh, I can open a, a test, but it's a fact that that one is just when I speak on a podium. I'm not on a podium. Different place, different tie. Uh, it's a joke, but it's real. Uh, so uh, let me call my friends here, Damiano. Uh, the other two you know already. I asked Damiano Airoldi to join. Uh, it, it's dangerous because it's, uh, they forgot to, to, to put the legs on the couch. So you're going to be like Fantozzi. So, okay. Okay. We, we need the Ursus then to, to crank them up. Uh, Lidi and Alfonso come over too. Uh, eh? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, I have the privilege uh, of having a real one. So, uh, okay, okay, good work. So, uh, the first panel is really a summary of what we heard, you know, knowledge. Are we smarter uh, in knowledge? I think the key in both presentation was sharing. When I first uh, was at the Media Lab with, with Lidi, we were talking with Mitch Resnick about the fact that our generation was the generation where, don't copy! Uh, at the exam, at, uh, at the, uh, when you have a grade in Italy, they put people all at, around all the corners because you don't have to copy. And Mitch said, we can't do anything about it. We have to build a new generation of kids that learn to share, that take other people's work and make it better. And uh, Alfonso is saying the same for uh, business. We have copyright, we have law, we have secret, we have uh, cryptography to prevent. And then we discover that there is a way in which sharing makes things happen. So, Lidi, uh, first quick question. How do you see this happening uh, around the world? I mean, how can an Indian guy share something with a Russian girl or whatever? Have you seen it multinational or just among a strict community to I happen? I to tell you a story that's actually an old one from Scratch, but when Scratch was very new, um, there was a young boy who was making programs and making characters, drawing something, and then animating it by writing a program for this. And he went to bed, posted his half-made project, because you can post your project and do more later. He posted his project. And overnight, um, a girl found his project, and she didn't like the images in it. So she wrote to him, and she said, your images are very bad. Is it okay if I fix the images for you? And he said, yes, I'm not interested in the images. That's really good. So she said, okay, well, it's quite convenient because I'm in Russia, so I can do it at night when you're asleep and in the morning you can go on with your work. So she, she fixed up the images and he went on with the programming and then she wrote back to him and said, well, look, actually, I don't know how to program very well, so if I make some characters for my project, will you help me with the programming? And very soon, these two and another kid got together and they said, hey, let's make a company. So they put up on Scratch that there was now the programming support company and you could apply to them to, for assistance. <laughs> and soon enough there were kids asking to help. But I think that the, the realisation that these, these two children were actually looking at the programming language in a different language. One was looking at the blocks with English words on them the other was looking at the same blocks with Russian words on them, but they were actually collaborating. And in the end, they began to learn from each other. These boys realized that it did make a difference to have good design. And the girl found that actually she could just copy some code. She didn't have to ask always for someone to do it. I think the realization that that can happen is terribly important to kids, because I think most kids feel that even though they'll do that in secret, they shouldn't do it uh, at school or where anyone knows. And I think most of us in the technology world really celebrate this kind of sharing. 
Yeah. Uh, one thing they used to say, ah, yes, this happened in Australia, this happened at the MIT, ah, oh, we poor Italian, we won't do it, ah, oh, we are a disaster, ah. So I asked Damiano, Damiano works uh, in a big project that is called Impara Digitale. Yes. And it's an association and a volunteer and describes a different situation of Italy. I just asked him to give us two slides with numbers. What is the reality? Yes, there are disasters in school in Italy where you don't even have the money to buy toilet paper. Yes, but there is another Italy. And I want you to show just those two little slides and comment, please. Okay. Uh, I would like to surprise you, so I speak Italian. <laughs> uh, Impara Digitale sta lavorando da due anni sull'esperienza di Dianora Bardi, un'insegnante che sul liceo Lussana di Bergamo nel 2010 ha, iniziato, ha sperimentato l'uso di, di tablet per, per fare didattica e per farlo basandosi su una, un modello che di fatto legge in Italia ma che eh, le scuole italiane stanno sostanzialmente ignorando, che si, si definisce didattica per competenze. Questa è l'attività di, di Impara Digitale negli ultimi due anni, Impara Digitale è nata, come dicevo, nel 2012 e per quanto rappresenti una, una briciola eh, di quello che serve per l'Italia, ma in realtà eh, i numeri sono particolarmente interessanti e sono un seme importantissimo per fare delle cose che eh, di fatto stanno cambiando e cambieranno eh, il modo di eh, insegnare e di imparare per, 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 dal, dal lato degli studenti. È straordinario eh, immaginare che ci sia così tanto da fare, è incredibile pensare che eh, l'Italia ignori di fatto delle direttive che sono legge, eh, vi assicuro che sostanzialmente il 99,99% ,99 delle scuole italiane, forse anche di più, eh, di fatto non sta operando come l'Europa dice, ma per contro le scuole che lo fanno hanno risultati straordinari. Ho citato il liceo Lussana di Bergamo, che è una delle storie più interessanti, ma, ma in sostanza sono, sono già molte le scuole che hanno queste, queste attività in corso. Qui vedete alcuni, alcuni risultati, alcuni diciamo, numeri. Eh, numeri ancora più recenti sono quelli del progetto che, eh, di Scuola Lombardia Digitale, che nasce dall'esperienza di, di, di Anora Bardi e che eh, due settimane fa è stato presentato dopo un anno di scuola 40 scuole all'interno della, della, della Lombardia hanno collaborato incontrandosi solo 5 volte e sviluppando di fatto un progetto straordinario di collaborazione nel cloud, nella rete, eh, quindi la condivisione per definizione di, di, di lavoro su un progetto come, eh, che, che tra l'altro è a fine eh, al, al, E poi dicono che non ci sono computer in Italia. Puoi far vedere la yes. situazione? Then they say that we have no computer. This is the situation of uh, Lombardy, just the Lombardy region. Sì, questa tra l'altro eh, sembra, vorrei condividerla, vorrei, sì, esatto. vorrei condividerla come una buona notizia, ma di fatto no, si può leggere anche come una eh, cattiva notizia. Eh, 25 milioni di euro, giusto per darmi un'idea, se fate due conti veloci, sono eh, quasi 80 mila tablet in, nella sola Lombardia e le altre regioni non stanno peggio, cioè ci sono diverse regioni che stanno anche meglio di questi, di questi numeri. 80.000 tablet in mano ai nostri studenti e eh, di fatto i risultati devono ancora tutti venire, quindi sono fantastiche le opportunità. Naturalmente ci sono anche un sacco di tablet, un sacco di oggetti che sono negli armadi, nelle cartelle sostanzialmente inutilizzati. Eh, questi soldi e questi oggetti sono finiti sostanzialmente tutti nelle scuole superiori, Stiamo parlando di 330 istituti che ne hanno usufruito, quindi un numero significativo all'interno del panorama lombardo e eh, anche la formazione non è niente male. Naturalmente ci sono altri problemi, spesso vengono spesi male questi soldi, es non esistono infrastrutture. Voi pensate cosa significa avere 70.000 tablet e non avere di fatto infrastruttura, non avere connettività internet a sufficienza? Eh, io, Lavorando anche nel settore business vi posso dire inequivocabilmente che non esiste struttura business anche in ambito enterprise che abbia la stessa densità di device per metro quadro eh, rispetto alle scuole. Quindi sono numeri davvero impegnativi per qualsiasi struttura, pensiamo okay. alla scuola cosa significa. Ok, uh, while you, you, you yes. come back at the, at the couch, um, one point is 
What makes the difference is not the technology, is the, the fact that you change the organization, the way you teach, the way you learn. Uh, Alfonso, does it happen in a corporation too? So when you apply a new technology, what happens to the organizational model? Uh, do you think that you have to change first the way you organize and then you apply technology or how do you see this? Well, you know, the story of the chicken and egg is uh, very old and it's difficult uh, to, to say which is the starting point. In, for sure, it is necessary to combine the two things together. And let me go back to the example I was showing. Uh, classically, you design, uh, well, let's say, at least in the, in the textbook, you say that you design system by you know, writing requirements and then designing the, the, uh, the architecture and then implementing the code and then testing it and deploying it. Uh, when you are, have an approach based on uh, mashup and service-oriented architecture, you do not do like that. It's really a different kinds of approach. You, you really, a different kind of approach. You really think about the assets that you want to share and make it available to the rest of the company. And then you have agile groups uh, developing specific applications or, or uh, you know, end user services uh, based on that assets. So the organization of the, the processes, the, really the attitude of the company is totally different. And um, we, when I work in, you know, it happens to me that I, I have the, the, the possibility to visit many companies. And you really see that, uh, uh, well, you must know the technology because too many times we say, well, technology is irrelevant. Well, if you know it first. But once you know the technology, then you really have to think about the way you want to use it depending on the goal you have. And this means that uh, you have to really adapt to the organization, the processes, the roles, the attitude of people, the way they interact. So there is a deep impact and deep, deep changes that you need to accommodate and enable in your organization if you want to really uh, adopt yesterday, a different approach. Yesterday in the typical after conference event, and I recommend you there is uh, something that is happening after the conference is buy a drink to the speakers, which is not a kind way in which I want to get drunk this evening, but is a way in which we want you to share our experience uh, way beyond the, the 10 minutes or the 20 minutes that we have here on stage. So yesterday night we were talking about uh, community managers within business, you know, how do we uh, encourage community dialogues inside a corporation. And we said, well, the corporation do not want to share, you know, you and Simple last year was talking about <laughs> corporation don't want, people want, people tweet, the corporation don't. So my question to Lydia is, uh, you have done works all around the world. And how do you see this fact that uh, this way of changing the learning affect businesses too? I mean, you've, you've tried uh, and struggled uh, to, to, to look at just the education, but then you saw something happening at teachers, for instance. How did teachers change the way they think, that they act, or how do they resist to this kind of change? And that's a really hard question. I think um, one of the things when Alfonso was talking is, for a lot of people, it's really frightening to change something and they have no belief in trying it to see if it makes a good difference or not. I mean, if you do the wrong thing, it'll fail. That's okay, it's good. But sometimes we have to try something and then we don't even know why it works. But if it works, I think there's a whole new way of thinking about, as you're saying, not the very old fashioned step, 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 step to development, but sometimes it's a cluster of things that come together and they work. Maybe afterwards we know why. And I think what that's happening a bit in education, I think, for example, that it's, it's worth talking about Finland. Finland is a funny country where it's very cold, it's very dark in the winter, so the children don't stay at school for very long, they don't go to school very many days, they don't do this, they don't do that. Wait a minute, they're doing better than any children in any other country in the world. 
So sometimes it, it, it's almost serendipity and then we can recognise that, that this has worked. And, and I think that there is a really big problem for us all holding on to, uh, or, or not even intentionally holding on to our ideas of the past. Seymour, I think, said something quite profound when he said to us, it's really hard to imagine the future with the experience of the past. So we really have to go out and make mistakes. Yeah, there is, for instance, something that Damiano told me. There was a conference in Milan about new education. And instead of having the teachers on the podium, uh, Dianora put the students on the podium talking about what they see is going to be the future. And it, and it was impressive because it's counterintuitive, you know? What, why do we have students to talk about education? They don't know wink about education. They are victims of education. But I think that Dianora was, was quite right. To, and by the way, the, the, the students were, were very good at to. Uh, Again, for, for the business portion, uh, Alfonso, what is the, the resistance that you see? What is the major, uh, and even Damiano if you want, uh, because you're in business too. Why, if, if this is so magic, as you said, it takes two weeks, it takes a fraction of the money. Why, why? <laughs> okay, okay, uh, in international apolitan. Well, if I knew, probably I would be able to solve it much quicker and we would be able to solve it in a very quick way. Uh, my impression is that there are, as usual, there is a combination of effects. One effect is that uh, we too often are ignorant. We do not know things. So, uh, I remember talking with a manager of a telecom company and uh, I was talking about interoperability about uh, systems. And he thought it was putting a, a link from a website to another website. It was not a student. It was the manager of telco company. So if this is the knowledge that we have of this complex phenomena, how can we uh, master them and treat them without fear? Of course, they, we are frightened. So first is, we must, we, for a long time, we have underestimated the role of technology, and now most of the managers and people in company do not know it. So first is this. Second, it's really having, my impression is that most companies, most managers are, you know, uh, let's say, frightened by the short-term vision, especially in this period of crisis, of course. I am a CEO, and I know that I have to produce results uh, quarter by quarter. And so I understand them, but of the, well, if we are not able to find the resources, emotional, uh, even before then, uh, you know, economic, if we don't find the, the resources to say, okay, we have to risk, to, to run a risk, to accept the risk of uh, uh, looking a bit uh, in the long term, then this is another motivation that, in my opinion, uh, is contributing to you know, uh, slowing down innovation. But uh, uh, obviously you can wave hands and, uh, and interact with us, obviously. We, we try to keep it short because it's uh, supper time and we, we feel and we hear your stomach uh, bubbling and, uh, and so we don't want to interfere with your biology for the time. Uh, but one thing is learning within the company. Okay? So we... We apply what we know about learning with our own employees. How many employees do you have? 50, 50? okay. Uh, how do you see uh, to, do you see a, uh, a desire to know within your high tech company or still a resistance even in the, in the employees you have? And then Alfonso, what do you think about? I think that uh, we, we have fear to, to share because we cannot control how we share the sharing process. So uh, it's better to do nothing than uh, doing something wrong. Uh, it's a fear to, 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 to share, the fear to, to, to lose the control of the information. I think it's a matter of control, uh, Alfonso. You, you think it's a matter of control. He used the term control. 
because well, I can tell you something that happened to me a few weeks ago. Uh, a person working at Sheffield moved to a different company. Um, and um, I met him uh, after a few months and I said, well, how, how is it going? And he said, you know, something really strange happened to me. Because at Sheffield, we are used to talk to each other freely. So anybody, well, we, we encourage, we encourage, you know, the, the discussion and sharing of information. So I, I was in, in this new company and I needed the information. So I went and visited a, my, a colleague of mine who was reporting to a person in a different line. And I was called by the manager say, why did you dare talking with him without asking my permission? Because information is considered a sort of, uh, uh, you know, asset that is uh, justifying the role. And if I lose that asset, then I lose my role. Well, I, I don't want to generalize based on a single example, but this was just, you know, a sort of an instance of a phenomenon that in my opinion occurs quite frequently. So it, it, it's not, the value is not what you are able to do because you are good, creative, uh, able to elaborate information, but just uh, you are good as long as you own some data that is critical. If you lose that, you do not value anything. Lady, yeah, the microphone. I'm just thinking of a little story about uh, in Canada when there was so much ice on the wires that the electric system and the telephone system wasn't working and there was a meeting to try and work out how to get the ice off the wires so the system could go again and the tea lady who was listening to the discussion said well if you put honey on the poles the bears will climb up the wires will shake and the ice will come off I think sometimes we as you're saying we we assume that the knowledge is somehow classified by the role. We have the reverse of what you're saying. And we don't look in the right place. We don't include the people who actually do the stuff, who may have the answer. Well, uh, just uh, to summarize, the goal of, uh, of State of NED this year is, is really try to understand in 20 years, because we're talking about a 20 years time frame since we met at the Cuccioli conference 20 years ago. Uh, what is smarter? What, what do you think is the real change you have seen? We have seen how many things do not work, that's fine. But what have you seen, uh, uh, Alfonso or, or Lidi or Damiano can answer, what do you think has really changed in, in a sharing of knowledge? Hmm. I'm just going to jump in quickly to be gone, and I think one of the things is a swing back is a thing we've seen. We've become obsessed with the technology, we love the technology, and now people are asking, yes, but what about the people? That we're beginning to, I think, ask some more critical questions, not to assume that every technology that's developed is actually beneficial and useful, and to ask that question that came up again this morning, that what is improving the life of the humans? What's making it better for people? So to smart to in, in so, the sense. So it's being critical, and, and not everyone has enough technical knowledge for that, but I think there is a, a beginning of a discussion in the community. For me, <clears throat> tools was changed. The tools are so, so simple, so accessible, that uh, all the people can use it. For example, students, students can, can use incredible tools in, in a so simple way that all the students now use uh, Google Drive, for example. Uh, this is a very, very important thing. To, to you, what, what is the real thing be, besides the fact that we can share music and talk and, and have fun and what is the real thing that when you see it, you say, okay, this we have it, this is a big change? Well, I can tell you just what happened to me uh, as uh, working at Sheffield. At Sheffield started 25 years ago, and uh, 25 years ago, our customers were ICT companies. So we used to work for IBM, Honeywell, Olivetti, because it was a separate sector. So there was some one, somebody developer com developing computers or software compilers, and then there was the rest of the society. Now we work for the rest of the society because ICT is becoming, is 
part of our daily life for everybody, for a single person, for a citizen, for a politician, for a company, for a social uh, community, for an organization. So the big change that I experienced in my life was that ICT from an individual separated sector became a sort of enabler for our daily life. And this is changing everything in our business, in our culture, in our education processes very, very deeply. And I'm not sure that we have really understood this uh, completely and thoroughly uh, as we should. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to finish up with, ah, there is a question. Yes, go. Before I, I have two minutes left. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, this, was, this was really cool. Uh, I was wondering, could you, could you like, um, have an idea of what would be the best way to motivate people to share knowledge, especially inside an, a company. Because like I was an intern in, in an organization where just one person knew how to create a report for higher management. And it was like, oh, I can't do it right now. Uh, could you please? But nobody knew. So it was like, OK, looking through the document, trying to do something. So what would be the like the best way to motivate them to share knowledge. Young people, older people, doesn't matter. Well, also, I, I can tell you about my experience. Our evaluation system is based on the ability to contribute. Uh, we, have a, in our, we have created a, uh, for our review, uh, annual review or periodic review process uh, of all our employees, uh, we, one of the key value, key parameters, which is uh, weighted the most is the ability to contribute and share information. How much you are proactive in supporting your colleague. So, uh, and this is not just a matter of you know, direct uh, influence. It's also a way of creating a culture. If this is what the company believes it is, import is important, then uh, I, I think, I hope, uh, it will help and support promoting a different way of behaving and working together in the company. Um, I want to leave you with, uh, ah, you have a question? Yeah, I, I just wanted to raise one quick area of concern, and I don't want to be a Luddite here. I mean, I'm setting up peer-to-peer -peer knowledge flow in development sector for IT and everything. But, all right, I think two things. First of all, we need to be very careful about Finland. All right, Finland also banned, effectively has no private education, so everybody's in the public educational system. They also, teachers are paid at the highest level of professional status within Finland, and they don't have the exams. I don't think any of that is linked to internet use in schools. And I think one of the dangers that they do use it in Finland is if we put people entirely into a virtual environment, we destroy a huge amount of capacity. Now, I think nobody is necessarily advocating that, but I think we're now starting to see a lot of evidence, certainly in primary school, that p kids are not getting enough time in physical play and are spending too much time in gaming environments. So I just wanted to put a balance back in there. Yeah, yeah I, I think that... Uh, uh, you have a lady? I, I, I really thank you for that, because I think that's a very important thing to say. I work in the, uh, with ISO setting up these dreaded standards that we all rely on, and particularly uh, amuses us when our Korean colleagues ask us if we want to know about smart schools. And we say, yes, yes, we, w tell us about smart schools. And they tell us that these are schools with, with electronic whiteboards made by a company called Smart. <laughs> and, and so I think that's really important. I, I certainly think the Finnish example is not about the technology, actually. It's about thinking about what's important in children's lives. And um, I want to, uh, to finish up with two stories. Story number one, when I met Lidi, uh, we were in Boston, and I asked her, would you come to Desenzano, where we ha want to have a conference about computers, technology, and education? And she said, yes. And I said, what do you want to do? I want to teach how to make a CD using HTML. But I said, but in Desenzano, they don't know about HTML. This is why we, we do a conference. I said, no worry, I'll do it. And in one week, People who had no clue on what the internet was or what HTML was produced a CD 20 years ago. Today, actually, 
uh, at the end of August, there will be the second edition of something that happened last year. An orchestra made of young kids from Desenzano, from Bled in Slovenia, and from Belgrade, and this year with uh, Ohrid in Macedonia, and from an Austrian town, will gather for one week to prepare a concert. And they never played together. They never knew each other. They barely don't know each other's language. But they end up in one week to produce a concert that is going to be magnificent. How does it happen? They magically understand that, a, that the score is not something you execute. It's just an example of a common goal that is worth your effort, that is worth sharing with your partner the, uh, the stand where you have the score. And if it does not do any good, you help him because the goal is the applause at the end of the concert. And kids from five different nations demonstrate this. And I encourage you to go around because there are many of these examples on how kids teach us how we can be smarter. Thank you and have a good lunch. Thank you.